I want to emphasize that the first thing I'm going to be talking about is some motivation for the epistemology for the rest of the world project. But it's not just motivation. Uh, should I do this? It's not just motivation, uh, but for um, the second part of the talk, I'll be speculating on, thank you, on some of the things we might be finding and the kinds of both philosophical and empirical, theoretical, and practical consequences that they might have. So that's where I'm going. So let me start with a bit of history, uh, that throughout the, uh, much of the history of Western philosophy, the central goals of epistemology including, included giving an account of what knowledge is and explaining how knowledge is possible and particularly important, I think, for our project, setting out and defending a normative account of belief revision, uh, an account that specifies the good and bad ways of forming and updating beliefs. Many methods were used uh, in that effort over the centuries. But in the middle years of the 20th century, a arguably, that's why the question mark is there, an arguably new method became enormously influential in many branches of philosophy. The analysis of philosophically important concepts came to be seen uh, as the central project of philosophy. And the method to be used was the careful examination of ordinary words and the use of ordinary words. Uh, that philosophical movement, of course, became known as the linguistic turn, and it was embraced by many philosophers, including many epistemologists. So let me just give you uh, one idea here. Uh, I'll focus on Norman Malcolm, a figure that many of you may not have heard of, but uh, he was a student and friend of Wittgenstein's. He brought Wittgenstein to the United States uh, at Cornell University for a period. And here's what Norman Malcolm said in 1951. Malcolm says, if we want to examine the use of a word, we must study the use of sentences in which the word occurs. We investigate the concept of knowledge by studying the usage of sentences in which the word know and cognate words occur. More recently, uh, <clears throat> epistemology has seen what uh, the philosopher Peter Ludlow dubbed the new linguistic turn. Uh, this emerged as philosophers debating the contextualist response to skepticism and related issues have, and these are Ludlow's words, explored the possibility that there might be linguistic evidence for or against contextualism. Uh, there's Ludlow and there's the article in which he said these things. Uh, there he is in another pose. Uh, and the quote continues, he says, though the new linguistic turn in epistemology breaks with the original linguistic turn in a number of respects, it follows it in the idea that we can use features of our language of knowledge attribution to support or refute certain positions in epistemology. Well. A great deal has been written about the historical and philosophical reasons for the first linguistic turn. Uh, just to tempt you a little bit, Wittgenstein clearly played a role. Uh, so did logical positivism. And uh, here's a quiz for the philosophers. How many of these folks can you identify? Uh, who's that? None of you? Oh, that's, <clears throat> that's Carnap. That's Freddie Ayer, and that's the hard one. Anybody got that one? That's very good. You get the prize. That's Moritz Schlick. OK. Uh, I thought we should all have photos of these folks. Uh, many philosophers, of course, have also argued uh, that the linguistic turn led epistemology in the wrong direction. Most famous of these, I'm sure, is Quine who urged that epistemology should be naturalized and should be treated as a branch of psychology. Hilary Kornbluth agrees that uh, epistemology should be naturalized, but he thinks it's best viewed as a, uh, <clears throat> that knowledge is best viewed as a kind, a natural kind studied by cognitive ethology. In a very different direction, my Rutgers colleague, uh, <clears throat> whom we call Ernie Sosa, but who down here is called Ernesto Sosa, uh, Ernie argues uh, that the claim that analytic philosophy in general 
and that epistemology in particular is primarily concerned with conceptual analysis is deplorably misleading. And uh, <clears throat> last one I'll mention, Alan Hazlitt, uh, a young and influential epistemologist, has argued that the marriage of epistemology and linguistic analysis of ordinary language is an unhappy marriage and it's time for a divorce. All right, well, let me say a little bit now, that's my history lesson, let me say a little bit about the motivations for the Geography of Philosophy project. First of all, the challenges to the linguistic turns in epistemology that these philosophers and others raised are interesting and important, and they were the backdrop uh, for the planning of the Geography of Philosophy project. But center stage, when we were writing the Geography of Philosophy grant proposal, was a feature of those linguistic turns in epistemology that's received much less attention. The linguistic turns didn't merely claim that we can use features of the language of knowledge attribution to support or refute certain positions in epistemology. Rather, uh, as that earlier quote from Peter Ludlow makes clear, it claimed that we can use features of our language, in case you didn't notice, uh, and our language was almost always English. The new linguistic turn in epistemology attempts to use features of contemporary English knowledge attribution to support or refute certain positions in epistemology. And in a very similar way, perhaps a bit less explicitly, uh, <clears throat> the first linguistic turn, the one that uh, Malcolm and many others were involved in, uh, was actually aimed at analyzing the concept of knowledge used by contemporary English speakers by studying the usage of English sentences in which the English word no and its cognate words were used. So one of the important questions we wanted to pursue when we planned the Geography of Philosophy project was, is there any justification for this practice Another way to pose the question is this. What's so special about contemporary English? Why should it play such a central role in epistemology? Well, <clears throat> let's think about it for a second. What's so special about English? First of all, contemporary English is one of approximately 6,000 extant languages spoken around the world. Uh, it's the native language of less than 6% of the world's population. Here's a lovely graphic for that. Uh, <clears throat> and when Western epistemology emerged in ancient Greece, English didn't even exist. So what's so special about English? Uh, <clears throat> why should the usage of sentences in contemporary English uh, in which the word no in cognate words occurs, or the concept of knowledge expressed by those words, or features of the language of knowledge attribution in contemporary English, why should these things play any special role in epistemology? In addition to the theoretical importance of those questions, and this slide and the next one is a bit of an aside, I suspect these questions are also of considerable practical importance for philosophers around the world. I'm pretty confident about this uh, in Asia and Africa. I'm curious about it in Latin America, so maybe you can fill me in on this. Uh, but although it's often not discussed openly, there's some reason to believe that the dominant role of English usage and English locutions <clears throat> of knowledge attribution has a demoralizing effect on many philosophers outside the English-speaking world. Young philosophers who are initially interested in epistemology quick, quickly grow disillusioned with the contemporary <clears throat> with contemporary epistemology, where subtle, and I mean subtle, particularly if you look at the new linguistic turn literature, subtle facts about English usage are given great weight. But facts about Quechua or Japanese or Isizulu or Korean usage are never mentioned. 
That may be part of the explanation for the relative lack of interest in epistemology in Africa and East Asia, and I'm curious to learn, is it the case elsewhere in the world? But that's an aside. My real question is, is there any justification for this practice? Well, here's one possible answer. It invokes what might be called the universality thesis. That claims that properties of the English word no and English sentences of the form S knows that P and related locutions that have been studied by epistemologists are shared by the standard translation of these expressions in most or all languages. If that's true, if the universality thesis is true, then the focus on English would simply be a matter of convenience for that vast majority of contemporary epistemologists who were either native speakers of or fluent in English. Uh, well, there are a number of ways in which the universality thesis might be or indeed has been defended. Uh, <clears throat> Some of them are very general, making claims about all sentences in all natural languages. Others are quite specific to sentences uh, using terms like no. Uh, they don't claim to be general language-wide features. Let me start with the general defenses uh, of the universality thesis. One figure who's uh, important here is the late Jerry Katz, Gerald J. Katz, who articulated a pair of theses uh, and defended them strongly. One was what he called the strong effability thesis. Uh, that can be summarized very quickly. Uh, the strong effability thesis is that every proposition is the sense of some sentence in each natural language. So what that's claiming is there's no proposition that can't be expressed in any natural language. Uh, <clears throat> choose your language. Uh, and uh, in a bit more detail, Katz also defended what he called uh, the translatability thesis. So this one's a bit technical and a mouthful. He says, for any pair of languages, and for any sentence S in one, and any sentence sigma of S, uh, <clears throat> sorry, er, any sense sigma of S, there's at least one sentence S prime in the other language, such that sigma is the sense of S prime. <clears throat> Clark is shaking his head. Not <laughs> true, okay? Uh, well, this is, uh, you know, Jerry uh, Katz, who is an <clears throat> old friend of mine, um, he had lots of strange views, but this wasn't one of them, if by strange we mean um, not held by other people. Uh, similar claims have been made uh, as far back as the <clears throat> late 1940s by Sapir. Uh, and uh, by Van Bentham, a uh, major philosopher of language uh, and linguist. Uh, and uh, the contemporary linguists from Fettel and Mathewson uh, in a 2007 paper uh, point out that a weakened version of translatability, which maintains that at the level of core truth, con <clears throat> truth conditional content, what one language can express any other language can express as well is a position that's quite, wi quite widespread among linguists and seems to be a reasonable stance to us as well. So this is not uh, an exotic uh, and um, idiosyncratic view that Jerry Katz was putting forward. But it's really far from clear that the effability or translatability thesis, even if they're true, so even if we grant that they're true, would provide the kind of universality that would be needed to justify the contemporary epistemological practice of focusing on English terms and sentences. Why not? Well, Katz and other defenders of translatability concede, they don't argue about this at all, that there may be lexical items in one language, say English, that have no translation in some other language. Uh, the example that's often used here, or similar examples similar to this, there are no terms in Piraha, is that how that's pronounced? Uh, <clears throat> for that's the language we're allegedly counting doesn't 
exist and so on. Uh, <clears throat> numbers don't go higher than two. Uh, in Piraha, uh, there are no terms for neutrino and mass, and no current way to translate neutrinos have mass. But Katz, who concedes this, thinks this isn't an important problem because, as he says, this is merely a temporary vocabulary gap, uh, right? Not a deep problem. But if there are no sentences in contemporary Japanese or Isizulu or Quechua that have the same truth conditional content as English sentences of the form S knows that P, and <clears throat> if no sentence in contemporary English uh, no sentences in contemporary English have the same truth conditional content as the Japanese sentences of, and you think I'm going to try to pronounce that, uh, <clears throat> but the first one is S shite iru, uh, <clears throat> uh, P, the second one is S, uh, S watake iru, P. Uh, interestingly, for those of you who know, who, who know a little bit of Japanese, that excludes me, by the way. I'm just relying on authority. These are the two standard translations of S knows that P into Japanese. Uh, they are not uh, <clears throat> uh, interchangeable, uh, and uh, it's not clearly understood uh, exactly how they differ from one another. Okay, but there are two of them in Japanese. So, if no sentence in contemporary English has the same con truth conditions as either of those Japanese expressions then it's very hard to see how the practice of focusing on English usage in epistemology would be vindicated by the alleged fact that a term for nose could in fact be introduced into Japanese or Isizulu or Quechua. That wouldn't do the work that's needed to justify the epistemological practice. All right. Well, a more promising approach uh, <clears throat> uh, to defending the universality thesis uh, puts these very general claims about translatability to one side and focuses on the contemporary English term, no, and the concept that it expresses, and on the use of contemporary English sentences of the form S knows that P. If this concept is expressed by an ordinary expression in all languages, then the practice of focusing on contemporary English terms, concepts, and sentences in epistemology is obviously much less problematic, even if it isn't the case that all sentences can be translated into all languages. And uh, perhaps the best known defenders of uh, the claim that no is a lexical universal are Anna Wierzbicka, uh, I'm not pronouncing that one properly either, probably. And Cliff Goddard, I'm pretty good on Goddard. Uh, uh, the leaders of the so-called natural semantic meta-language program. And maybe I ought to pause here to say that uh, there are very few difference, very few places where the leadership of the uh, 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 geography of philosophy project disagree. This is one of them. Uh, Edward is much more sympathetic uh, to the natural semantic meta-language program, or at least this claim, than I am. All right. According to Vizbitska uh, and Goddard, no is what they call a semantic prime. It's common to all languages. Now, <clears throat> I think the, the, uh, their work is interesting and important. But I don't think the evidence offered by researchers in the natural semantic meta-language tradition supports a version of the universality thesis that will vindicate the focus on contemporary English in epistemology. Why not? Well, at the center of my skepticism is, a <clears throat> uh, is the criterion of concept identity and of cross-linguistic I meaning identity that's appropriate uh, in the kind of epistemological analysis uh, that's being done uh, in contemporary epistemology. What counts as, con as a, uh, uh, a requirement on concept identity? Well, here's Frank Jackson offering a necessary, not a sufficient condition, but Frank says uh, that if an English speaker's intuitions about Gettier cases, for example, are different from ours, where it's clear from the context by, uh, that he means by ours, his and those of most philosophers. 
And if it's clear that this speaker is not confused about the case being considered, then the right thing to conclude is that her concept of knowledge is different from ours. Uh, I think this is a reasonable, uh, necessary condition on concept identity, and as you'll see uh, in the next couple of slides, I'll show you at least one uh, other philosopher who agrees with me. But notice that the evidence marshaled in the natural semantic meta-language tradition gives us no reason at all to think that speakers of all languages share our Gettier intuitions, where remember ours are Frank Jackson's and those of uh, most professional English-speaking philosophers. Uh, indeed, there's even some evidence to suggest that not all English speakers share our Gettier intuitions. Um, <clears throat> there is some evidence in papers that Edward and I and others have produced uh, that all English speakers, and indeed maybe speakers in other languages, have some Gettier intuitions. But whether they have the same Gettier intuitions, uh, it's not clear that it, that's true even of all English speakers. So I mentioned that Jackson's criterion, his necessary condition, is hardly unique. Uh, <clears throat> it was shared by Fred Dretzky, for example. Uh, according to Dretzky, if experimental philosophy studies were to detect significant differences between no in English and the standard Japanese translation, then Dretzky says that Japanese word would not be the Japanese counterpart of the English word no. So uh, <clears throat> if this or something in this vicinity uh, is the appropriate notion of concept identity for epistemology, and I think it is, then Wierzbicka and Goddard haven't come even close to showing that no is a semantic universal. Similarly, uh, <clears throat> if no in English is factive, uh, everybody comfortable with factive? A verb is <clears throat> S knows that P is factive. If, uh, <clears throat> if S knows that P is true, uh, then P has to be true. That's what it is to be factive. Uh, if no is factive in English, then for epistemological purposes, a verb in another language that doesn't have the same meaning or express the same concept, uh, <clears throat> I sorry, I, I missed that sentence. A verb in another language doesn't have the same meaning or express the same concept. If it's not factive, it better well darn well be factive uh, to express the same meaning or concept. But here again, the evidence marshaled by the natural semantic meta-language program uh, <clears throat> doesn't uh, establish that verbs standardly translate as no are factive. Indeed, in an influential paper by Alan Hazlitt that I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, Hazlitt has argued that no in English isn't factive. It's far from clear that no is factive in English. There's the uh, <clears throat> much debated paper where he argues this. Now, I take no stand on this. I don't know whether no is uh, <clears throat> factive in English. I take no stand on Hazlitt's provocative claim. Uh, what all I need here is, uh, <clears throat> and what makes his work important for our purposes, uh, is that it shows how hard it is to establish whether a verb is factive. And indeed, an anecdote that I'll add here, it's not part of the uh, <clears throat> slides I've prepared, I originally got into this about 10 years ago at a conference in Japan uh, where at the break uh, over tea I asked a group of Japanese scholars, mostly philosophers, some linguists, a few psychologists, and there were a few Chinese in the group as well, whether <clears throat> the word for no in Japanese was factive or the word for no in Chinese was factive. And I was stunned by the fact that they got into a roaring argument and they couldn't agree whether the word was factive in Japanese and Chinese. Uh, so uh, I take it what this establishes is that it's hard to know whether a verb is factive. Uh, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> if it hasn't been done for no in contemporary English, it's clear that the work uh, in the natural semantic meta-language tradition uh, hasn't shown whether the standard translations for no are factive in Japanese, or Mandarin, or Isizulu, or Hindi, or Quechua. So take that, Edward. 
Uh, <laughs> nor, to the best of my knowledge, has any research program seriously addressed this issue. Okay. So where are we? How are we doing on time? I, uh, I, I'm, I'm going faster than I usually do. Uh, is the universality thesis true? The answer, I submit, is that at present we really don't know. And since the universality thesis is the most obvious way to defend the prevailing practice of focusing on the epistemic language and epistemic concepts of contemporary English speakers, it's important to find out whether the universality thesis is true. So let me go back to some motivation for the project. One important motivation for the Geography of Philosophy project was to enable linguists, anthropologists, psychologists, and experimental philosophers to collaborate in the study of epistemic language and epistemic concepts that prevail in cultures around the world. And that, I take it, is what we're beginning to do right here and right now. And it's our view that the sort of cross-linguistic, cross-cultural analysis of epistemic terms, sentences, and concepts undertaken by this project and by researchers in the project has a crucial role to play in philosophical epistemology. But there's more. Uh, <clears throat> We, uh, and I think I speak for all three of us here, uh, we also expect that our cross-cultural, cross-linguistic analysis of epistemic concepts may have important practical and theoretical implications in a wide range of areas. So what I want to do now is, first of all, consider some of the things that might be uh, outcomes of uh, our uh, collective research and then ask what sorts of implications in two different categories can be drawn. The category I'll focus on at most length will be within philosophical epistemology, but at the end I also want to talk about more practical and more broadly theoretical implications. So what are the possible, what could happen uh, as the result of the studies that we are collectively undertaking? Obviously, one possible outcome of the cross-linguistic and cross-cultural studies that we're conducting is the discovery that, in fact, no and its standard translations are indeed cross-cultural universals, expressing the same concept and exhibiting the same linguistic properties in all languages. This is, I stress, logically possible, okay? Uh, <clears throat> it would be a remarkable discovery which would cry out for an explanation. Why are these terms, uh, <clears throat> why is these, these terms, concepts present in all languages? And it would, I think, open an important new area of interdisciplinary inquiry. But I'm not gonna dwell on that very much because uh, <clears throat> another possible outcome, and this is the one I suspect is much more likely, is that the universality thesis is false and that the epistemic concepts and locutions of contemporary English are culturally local. They don't have close counterparts in many other languages and cultures around the world. Well, suppose that's right. How should epistemologists deal with that outcome? So suppose what we discover is the universality thesis is false, epistemic terms and concepts embedded in 21st century English are culturally local. How could epistemologists react to that? Well, there are no doubt a number of uh, answers. I'm going to focus on three. I'm also going to talk about, after I give you my uh, three epistemologists' reaction, I'm also going to ask how social scientists and policymakers should deal with that outcome, the outcome of the universality thesis being false. So, starting with epistemology, three ways to deal with the falsehood of the universality thesis. Number one is to say, who cares, okay? 
Uh, this is not at all an exotic response as emerged in some of the conversations over lunch, okay? Uh, indeed, uh, it derives from some of the work of Paul Grice, uh, one of the crucially important philosophers of language uh, in the late 20th century. Uh, in his studies in the way of words, uh, Grice says the following about conceptual locality in any domain, not just epistemology, okay? He says, if my assumption that what goes for me goes for others, so he said, you know, why am I analyzing my concept? Well, I, I assume what goes for me goes for others. But uh, if that assumption uh, is mistaken, it doesn't matter. My philosophical puzzles have arisen in connection with my use of some term E, some philosophically troubling expression. And my conceptual analysis will be of value to me and, of course, to any others who may find that their use of that term coincides with mine. So this is the, it doesn't matter if most people disagree with me, if other cultures don't have this term, doesn't matter at all. Oh, that's a very general view. Uh, <clears throat> Abner Baz, uh, in a recent article, offers a uh, Grice-inspired uh, response to the possibility of cross-cultural diversity uh, in epistemic and other terms uh, in a debate that uh, he had with me uh, oh, about 10 years ago or so now. So uh, let me read this uh, through, uh, <clears throat> although it's a long quote. Uh, I think it's a useful one. Baz says, it seems eminently plausible that people who are sufficiently different from each other in their basic sensibilities, practices, and metaphysical commitments will also be different from each other more or less significantly and more or less pervasively in their concepts. However, if the prevailing program, and that's just his jargon for contemporary philosophical practice in the analytic tradition, uh, if the prevailing program can help us become clearer just with respect to our concepts, the ones we share only with those sufficiently like us, that's enough to make it worth pursuing. The answer to Stitch's question of why we should care about what is merely our concept is accordingly simple, because it's ours. Uh, and to become clear about it is to become clearer about those features and dimensions of ourselves and our world to which the concept is responsive and of which there <clears throat> it is therefore revelatory. Well, uh, <clears throat> I think that that's one legitimate kind of reaction one might have to the finding that the universality thesis is false and that epistemic concepts differ dramatically or maybe not so dramatically across cultures. Uh, <clears throat> but it's important to realize that People in other cultures can say exactly the same thing. They can say, my conceptual analysis will be of value to me and to any others who may find their use of, and here I'm not going to try to read my own slides, that in Japanese, that in Hindi, that in Chinese, that in Korean, that in Lao, and that in Arabic. Do I have any more? No. Uh, coincides with mine, everybody, or each culture and each language could give uh, Bosses and uh, Grice's response. So the Gricean reaction to linguistic and conceptual diversity actually suggests a kind of fragmentation of epistemology. Epistemology is no longer one subject. It fragments into Japanese epistemology, Hindi epistemology, Chinese epistemology, Korean epistemology, Lao epistemology, Arabic epistemology, Quechua epistemology, and so on, all right? Well, here it might be argued that these language-linked epistemologies shouldn't be considered part of epistemology. Certainly, they shouldn't be considered, uh, it might be argued, they shouldn't be considered part of philosophical epistemology at all. One might ask, uh, and there's a debate to be had here, which we, I don't have time to pursue in this talk, uh, uh, <clears throat> why are these epistemologies? Rather, they might more plausibly be viewed as part of linguistics. Perhaps this endeavor uh, is comparative lexical semantics. As an aside, uh, I'll raise a question, which again, I don't have time to explore with you today, but one might ask uh, <clears throat> whether 
when a Japanese speaking philosopher says S, and that's one of those Japanese terms for knowledge, uh, that P, uh, and an English speaking philosopher says S does not know that P, are they really disagreeing with one another uh, or are they just talking past one another? But in any event, some of the issues that arise in the who cares response to the possible finding of this project. Second response to finding that the universality thesis is false would be divorce. I noted earlier that Hazlitt uh, has suggested that we give up on the linguistic method in epistemology. And he's advocated a divorce for the linguistic theory of knowledge attributions and traditional epistemology. Uh, well, Hazlitt's reasons uh, don't appeal to linguistic and conceptual diversity. Nonetheless, one possible response to finding that the universality thesis is false uh, might, that might be tempting would be a, what I'll call a Hazlitt divorce, uh, separating epistemology uh, from uh, the linguistic analysis and trying to do what Hazlitt not implausibly argues, uh, give a purely philosophical epistemology arguing what features the concept of knowledge should have, not uh, <clears throat> what uh, features it has uh, in various uh, languages or amongst various language speakers. So that's the second one. The third one that I actually think is the most interesting and promising uh, kind of reaction to the finding, if it indeed is the finding, of a project like ours, uh, that there are uh, <clears throat> important and interesting cross-linguistic and cross-cultural differences in the concepts that come closest to the concept of knowledge uh, grows out of uh, the business of conceptual engineering. So for those of you who aren't philosophers, uh, you may need a little background here. In recent years, philosophers have urged that in addition to analyzing philosophically important concepts, philosophers should also build new and better versions of the concepts that they've inherited from their language and culture. Uh, <clears throat> this hasn't been a prime focus in epistemology up till now. It's uh, <clears throat> gotten its initial um, grip on the philosophical world uh, with uh, more normatively and socially loaded concepts like gender, but it could perfectly well be applied to epistemological concepts as well. The goal of conceptual engineering and epistemology would be con to construct new and better successor concepts of knowledge and related concepts as well, of course. Uh, and as I said, this is, the pro this is the epistemological project where I think the Geography of Philosophy project may have the most profound philosophical impact. Why? Well, if, as I suspect, we're going to find that there are important differences among the concepts of knowledge used in cultures around the world, then the project will provide a rich source of building blocks uh, for epistemological engineers. Rather than what the typical conceptual engineer does, starting with the concept of his or her own culture and changing, proposing alternatives, proposing improvements, Rather than starting with the concept of knowledge in contemporary English, the epistemological conceptual engineer will have at her disposal an array of concepts uh, in the knowledge family that have evolved in many cultures uh, that we're now studying. And these can serve as models uh, <clears throat> and contribute unique features to be used in constructing new epistemic concepts. But in addition to providing the philosophical conceptual engineer with new raw material, the Geography of Philosophy project may provide a new and important perspective uh, when the epistemological conceptual engineer is basically assessing what she has built, assessing the strengths of various proposed replacement concepts. Why? How? Well. Geography of philosophy researchers won't only be describing an array of knowledge concepts. 
He'll also be describing, and we got wonderful examples of that this morning, uh, they'll be describing the cultural contexts in which these knowledge concepts play an important role. And what works well in one cultural context uh, may work very poorly in a very different cultural context. And I think uh, for those of you who haven't read them, uh, the uh, recent blog posts uh, by people in this room, uh, Josh, Josh and Jordan and uh, Emanuele, uh, are wonderful examples of how it can be the case that works, what works well in one, con in one context, what conceptually works well in one context, uh, may work very poorly in a different uh, cultural context. So as the conceptual, and I agree with the conceptual engineers, uh, that it's a mistake to think that the epistemic concepts that prevail in a culture can't be improved. Uh, but as our anthropology uh, colleagues make clear, it's also a mistake to take a one-size-fits-all approach to epistemological cultural engineering Cultural engineering may have to be, indeed almost certainly will have to be culturally local and take account of the nature of the culture in which the concept is going to be used. Well, because of the interdisciplinary dialogue that's at the center of the project, I think we're uniquely well uh, <clears throat> prepared to make important contributions to culturally informed conceptual engineering in epistemology. So that's one of my hopes and advertisements for the project. But, and uh, this is the part uh, where I'm actually most excited about uh, but have the least to say about, as you'll see, there are only three or four slides here. I also expect that our cross-linguistic and cross-cultural analysis of epistemic concepts may have important theoretical and practical implications in a wide range of areas. But this is mostly terra incognita. Uh, so this is an area where, uh, <clears throat> as you'll see, I think we all need each other's help. How? How might it have these sorts of practical implications? Well, I'll give you two very tentative suggestions uh, before inviting additional ideas. An intriguing and important idea was proposed by one of the people who, in fact, inspired and advised us when we began planning the project. This is the late Michael Chandler. Uh, Michael, a psychologist uh, at the University of British Columbia who passed away earlier this year. Uh, Michael was a leader uh, at exploring the conceptual world and, in particular, the epistemological world of First Nation peoples in Canada. And here is a quote from uh, a paper of Michael's that's very much worth reading indeed. Uh, he says that scholars uh, claim that indigenous people subscribe to epistemological frameworks or ways of knowing that are importantly different from those commonly practiced within the cultural mainstream. If this is true, and maybe I should add before finishing the quote, uh, Chandler wasn't clear that they were true. He thought it was an intriguing suggestion that needed to be explored. He spent the last half dozen years of his life trying to explore them uh, and not succeeding. It turned out to be enormously difficult for a whole bunch of reasons, theoretical and political. Uh, so he wasn't sure that the <clears throat> this is true. But what he was sure, sure of, and I think he's just exactly right here, is that if it is true, uh, if the forms of and if the forms of pedagogy to which students are routinely exposed are typically set within knowledge frameworks that indigenous learners experience as foreign and hostile, then trouble is automatically afoot. And school failures and lost educational opportunities are sure to follow. So that's one of the ways in which the sorts of work we do may have profound uh, practical implications. So I talked about practical and theoretical. Let me give you just one 
tiny teaser on theoretical beyond the philosophical, and then I'll stop. Uh, <clears throat> very different proposal uh, of a practical uh, nature uh, was proposed by one of the advisors to the Geography of Philosophy project, and indeed maybe my oldest uh, intellectual and academic friend, Dick Nisbet. So, uh, <clears throat> Nisbet notes that world-class innovative science, as measured by a bunch of measures, but Nobel Prizes and similar awards, world-class innovative science is much less common than what one might expect in East Asia, uh, <clears throat> in countries like Japan and China, despite their large and very impressive and very successful investment in world-class universities. Why, Nisbet asks, why don't uh, <clears throat> the Chinese and Japanese produce more Nobel laureates? Well, he doesn't think he knows the answer, but he speculates that uh, <clears throat> Uh, part of the explanation may be posed by, may be provided by the fact that different conceptions of how inquiry is organized and how knowledge is discovered may explain these facts. Okay. Well, obviously, those two ideas, Chandler's on a very practical, uh, <coughs> um, a politically important issue, uh, Nisbet's on a much more theoretical issue. Uh, these two ideas are just the tip of the iceberg on the practical and theoretical implications that the falsehood of the universality thesis and the ways in particular that it turns out to be false uh, may produce. Well, one of the deliverables of the Geography of Philosophy project, for those of you who don't know, when you get a heap of money from a wonderful granting agency like the John Templeton Foundation, you have to promise them stuff. Not your firstborn child, but deliverables, okay? <laughs> and one of the deliverables uh, that we owe the Templeton Foundation is a volume for a broad audience, the general learned audience, not specialists uh, in linguistics or specialists in epistemology. One of the deliverables is a volume for a broad audience. It's our hope that a substantial part of that volume will be devoted to practical and theoretical implications of cross-cultural differences and cross-cultural similarities in conceptions of knowledge. And we hope that all of you will consider contributing to that volume. Indeed, in a sense, what I'm doing in this talk is issuing an invitation uh, for people <clears throat> associated with the project and people who aren't currently associated with the project to think of uh, contributing to a volume on the implications of the work we're doing. 